Good morning and welcome to the Mullen Automotive Museum here in beautiful Oxnard, California. Today we're going to be taking another in-depth look at one of our gorgeous cars. Actually, a car I think is a little hot rod. It's a 1928 Lorraine Dietrich. And with us today is uh, my pleasure to welcome Jim Robinson here to help us walk us through this car. Jim has been a docent here at the museum about four years, and a couple years ago we had a chance to uh, go together to Pebble Beach. Welcome and thanks for being here. We look forward to learning more about this car. Well, Doctor, it's great to be here, and it's wonderful to talk about this beautiful car. The 1928 Lorraine Dietrich B3-6 was a remarkable t car for the time. It was a sports car that was a standout, and it was basically built after the successful race career of its brethren in the 24 Hours of Le Mans. You and I have been around the sun a couple times. <laughs> too I'm, many times. Too many times. <laughs> and I'm a firm believer that there's nothing new under the sun, especially in the car world. If I was to tell you I'm thinking about a sports car that had a Hemi head engine, aluminum pistons, knockoff wheels, wood line steering wheel, leather trim seats. Where does that take you? Uh, to me, it takes me to a brand new Corvette. Brand new I'm Corvette. Biased. I'm with you on that. <laughs> this particular car has all those and more. It even has a head-up display. As we go around the car, we'll pick up little features like, well, let's take this Cyclops light in the center for one. This is very similar to a projector beam headlight now seen on Porsches. Mm -hmm. BMWs. BMWs. Yeah. Wow. This is 1928. 1928. Yeah. Another interesting feature about this car, it features 20-inch wheels. Now, that's the trend today. The new Corvette, I believe, has 20-inch wheels. It does. Center knockoff wheels. Keep in mind, this is 19. 28. Rick, the logo is the medallion that symbolizes the region of France from which this car was named after, Lorraine. That's right next to Alsace, isn't it? It is. Little, uh, An west. interesting thing, I'm glad you brought that up. Alsace is the region where Bugattis mm -hmm. were made. Mm -hmm. Now you're wondering, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> I am. Bugatti, as a young engineer, as a young man, worked for Lorraine Dietrich ah. before he started out on his own. So they came from the same geographic area, roughly, mm -hmm. of France. And, and Dietrich then, where does Dietrich come in? Dietrich was the family name that was one of the founders of Lorraine Dietrich, mm -hmm. much like Ford or mm -hmm. Chevrolet or Dodge. Mm -hmm. Most of the automobile manufacturers put the family name in there. The name Dietrich was one of the founding family members which carried the name. However, because of the strife of the region that Lorraine was in, they were on the borderline of several different countries, and the, there was always some kind of war going on. <laughs> the War of 1870, <laughs> World War I. That region was always being taken over, depending on the political winds at the time. So to show Unity, they named the car after the region in which it was built, Lorraine. While we're so close here, maybe you can point out what I think you referred to earlier as the heads-up display in this car. The head-up display is a Boyce Motometer. Boyce is a company that was founded and uh, headquartered in New York. And so you're saying, how did it get its products onto France? It was a very prestigious item to have on your car, a Boyce motor meter. It was bling at the time. So if you were uh, a fashionista, you would make sure that the bling included a Boyce motor meter. But it was also a precursor to our head-up display, where as you drive this car, you don't need to glance down at the instrument panel. You can look straight ahead and watch your car boil over. This had an interesting uh, radiator system where <clears throat> they were not pressurized at the time. So it was very critical that you keep your car from boiling over and the motometer was a very important instrument to keep your eye on. Rick, if you notice, this car does not have running boards, which mm. was common at the time. 
It does have a single step plate where you can get in and out a little bit easier, mm -hmm. but the frame rails have been pinched in, the running boards have been eliminated, and that was for uh, weight reduction, and that was also for their early attempts at aerodynamics. Hmm. Well, I don't believe this particular car actually raced. It's a race-inspired uh, car. Hmm. However, I think it does continue with the same theme as the uh, running boards that have hmm. been removed for weight reduction. And I think aerodynamics might be a little bit of a stretch of imagination for elimination of the front and rear bumpers. But let's go with weight reduction. And about the only bumper it has for rear protection would be the spare tire and wheel, which you might consider much like a Jeep. Well, Jim, we're very lucky today. We were able to open the hood on this lovely Lorraine Dietrich. We're looking at the exhaust side of the engine here. Maybe you could uh, point out some of the most important features about this engine. I'd be happy to, Rick. If you notice the canister on this side of the motor, that'd be your oil filter, oil reservoir, uh, which is, uh, common to every motor today. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is not common for motors today are the exposed push rods. You see the push rods are on the outside of the block. Today, typically, push rods are encased within the block. And this unit down here looks quite complex. Maybe you could uh, tell us what that does. It's three in one, Rick. It's a starter, it's a generator, and it also serves as a water pump. Wow. You know, so I see there's a, the hose that comes straight up here off the radiator that comes back into this, and then I guess, is this the return then that goes back to the top of the radiator? It's part of the thermal siphon uh, system that oh. uh, cars had at that time. Okay, and this is the exhaust manifold that comes down here. What's wrapped around the, manif the exhaust manifold? You're right, Rick, this is the exhaust manifold, and one of the reasons why they wrap the exhaust manifold is to contain the heat. They mm -hmm. want to keep the heat in the exhaust system for as long as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. Also, to protect the bodywork from any excess heat building up in certain points that would damage the bodywork. And this is a six-cylinder engine? Yes, it is. And it, about what kind of di displacement are we talking it's about? It's not quite four-liter displacement. Four liters. <laughs> four liters and about mm -hmm. 70 horsepower and they obtained speeds uh, in the 90s uh, mm -hmm. with this configuration. And any idea what the RPMs would be, uh, you know? No idea, but when we get to the interior, we'll have a big tack to look at, so we'll, <laughs> we'll address that at Very the time. Very good. All right, well, maybe we could go around and look at the intake side of the engine. Let's do it. Well, Jim, uh, we're over here on the intake side of the engine, and thank goodness we were able to raise it up and under, look under the hood today. You want to point out some of the features over here on this side? Be happy to, Rick. You'll notice here's the carburetors over here, but another thing that we've discovered is the fact that there's another set of spark plugs, another distributor, and another coil. So this had two spark plugs per cylinder, quite a race feature for that. And another thing that we discovered, Rick, is the starter and the starter solenoid is actually on this side of the motor. So the combined starter generator on the opposite side of the motor isn't really a starter generator. It'd be a generator water pump on okay. the other side. So it's a double function with the starter on yes. this side. But the dual ignition feature is, is amazing. And if you also notice that the detail on the engine pan, you see that the engine turning on the engine pan is something that you rarely see on passenger cars today. But race cars, it was fairly common. And that was another detail where they could check the cleanliness, they check for any cracks. Engine turning kind of brings out those features if that should happen to the motor. Okay, and what kind of carburetors are those? Those are Zenith carburetors. Mm -hmm. And Zenith uh, is continuing uh, producing carburetors to this day, and actually fuel injection systems for today's, for today's now, automobile. Now, you mentioned something about this car has hydraulic brakes. It does, here's a hydraulic brake reservoir. Wow. So for 1928, that's pretty amazing. Now, I will say that these are drum brakes, they're not disc brakes on most uh, cars of today. And one of the things that we haven't talked about is the horn. Mounted in the engine compartment, much like 
most of the cars today mounted in the engine compartment. Well, Jim, we've been able to get on the inside of the car here so we can look at, look at some of the features here. First of all, you see this gorgeous steering wheel. What do you think a steering wheel is made out of, Jim? Well, I guess it would be bird's eye maple. The same as the dash? Very similar, yes, Very sir. similar. So, uh, and right away, the first thing you notice behind the steering wheel is this gauge up here. What's that all about? Well, that's part of your high-performance instrumentation system, Rick, much ah. like the cars of today. It goes along with your head-up display. Well, you know, I've owned 45 cars, and I would say I put tachometers on a lot of them because they didn't come with tacks, and, you know, you got to put it right on the steering column right in front of you where you can see it. On the dash, after you see that, first of all, you see the gear shift lever down here and the e-brake or parking brake, if you wish, usually an e-brake. That's what they were mostly used for. Uh, over here, just to the left of the, the instrument panel, is the choke, so you can pull up and out to adjust the choke. Up on the top, that's your horn button. It's not on the steering wheel, but up here in the top. The little switch underneath that pulls in and out. That is your light for the, the panel lights to, put, to light up the instruments. We have three gauges across the bottom, an amp gauge, a fuel gauge, and then over here is, your, is the oil uh, pressure gauge. And to the far right is the old temperature gauge, which is in a racing car is very, very important to have so you can know what the temperature of the oil is along with what the water temperature is. In the cluster in the middle is all your electronic panels. There is the little switch, the bronze little uh, switch right here that the key goes into. It's a kind of a round, large key that goes in. That is your, uh, turns on your ignition. And then you have the starter button. And then up here, that as far as I know is, is a dummy. It doesn't really do anything at this point. And the lever on to the right has several different positions and those are actually your, your headlights, your running lights, the other lights that we've seen on the front of the car. And of course off to the right is uh, your speedo that tells you how fast you're going and it's in kilometers of course. This car shows uh, 35,010 kilometers and to the right of that is a little dial that you can turn up and it resets your trip gauge which is in a small little window over here to the right. There is a lovely polished uh, stainless steel light on the top to give you light on the inside of your car. If you look down on the floor here you can see all the uh, the pedals that operate the car. Uh, the one on the far right is actually just a footrest. The smaller one here is your accelerator pedal and then of course you have your brake and your clutch pedal still has the logo on it uh, for Lorraine Dietrich. And in the middle between the brake and the clutch is this other uh, button, and that's actually your starter button. So you turn the ignition on up here in the dash, and then you depress down on that button to actually start the engine. Over on the left-hand side of the steering column, behind the steering column, is another lever. That's your throttle, and you might consider that to be a modern speed control. Uh, you would depress the accelerator down to where you would like the speed to be, and then you would adjust the throttle up until you feel that it's holding the throttle down. Now, you got to make sure you work with it manually because there is no electronic override when you hit the brakes or the accelerator or the, as there is in a modern car. Another interesting feature of this car is it only has one windshield wiper, and it's right up here in the top, and it's manually operated, so you got to move it back and forth yourself as you're, uh, you're driving. And over to the left, you can see there's two knobs on both sides of the windshield. Uh, the air condition in this car is such that you would release the tension on th this uh, nut up here, and you would move the windshield out in front of you to catch the air coming off the hood and coming back into the car. And also down here, you can, uh, if you take the top down, you can reduce, r relax this tension here, and the whole windshield will fold down. One of the other interesting features of this car is if you notice the door here on the inside, you see it does not have any windows. Uh, so that this is a really open car. Uh, when you want to open the car, you have to reach in and uh, pull this little lever forward to uh, unlatch the door. There is on both sides these hidden panels where you can do a little bit of storage, maybe your registration materials. Those kinds of things could be kept there. Again, finished in this beautiful leather that you see throughout the entire car. And as was said earlier, most of these cars had leather because they were exposed to the elements. And if you would just rotate up a little bit, you could see the beautiful wood framing that holds this roof on and uh, the beautiful polished 
aluminum or steel, I believe, uh, polished stainless steel that's used uh, for the uh, articulation of the top of this, uh, of this beautiful Lorrain Dietrich. Well, Jim, one of the things I also noticed is there's no window glass in this door and there's no door handle. To get into the car, you have to reach in and pull the door handle forward to open the door. And it's interesting, it has a regular kind of standard format door rather than the suicide doors that you see on so many cars of this vintage. Since this car represents a true sports car of its era, the top is just a, an aid for unpleasant days. Maybe a little bit of rain, too much sun, but for the most part this car would be seen on the roads top down, windshield forward. Now you're probably wondering how I've been carrying this golf club around. Well, since this is a true sports car, and as of sports cars today like the new Corvette, the engineers were challenged on they must provide space for a set of golf clubs. 1928, true sports car, they needed a space for golf clubs. Their solution, a bespoke door in the side of the aluminum body just for golf clubs. Easy solution. Well, Rick, this has been a lot of fun. We've discussed the 1928 Lorraine Dietrich. We've talked about nothing new under the sun, some of the features that this car has. Now, if it was up to you, what car would you choose? Well, I'm not sure what the audience would choose, but uh, having already had a, a 1966 Corvette that's parked at home, uh, I would think maybe this car would be my preference. Uh, nothing like having a hot rod, top goes down, I have a coupe. So there's some advantages to having this car. And thank you so much for uh, joining us today and walking us through the car. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks, Rick. Thank you again. Appreciate it, Jim. Well, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here. We're always happy to uh, share the cars with you. Mr. Mullen loves to open up the collection for people. And we hope that you'll be able to come and visit us here in Oxnard very soon. And that if you have a chance, please feel free to come to our website. It's been uh, recently redone. And you can uh, look online at all of the uh, fabulous cars and parts of the collection that we have here. So again, if you'd like to, that's the MullenAutomotiveMuseum.com for our website. And we certainly hope that you can join us here in Oxnard in person sometime soon. Thanks so much, and we hope you enjoyed the show.